Now, many individuals with ADHD have been frightened to death that the medications are dangerous. Avoid the medication. The disorder doesn't exist. Uh, it's a figment of uh, the drug company's imaginations or doctors' imaginations. And it's due primarily to anxiety or lack of sleep and whatever. What they've done is there are aspects of truth to all of this, but most of it is fantasy. It turns out that if you can improve the self-esteem of these individuals with medicine, if properly supervised in low doses, you'll get no side effects, okay? If you treat patients early, you can avoid impaired self-esteem, flunking out of school, academic and personal failures, social failures, if you can prevent all these, you're going to prevent that child or adult from dropping out of school, dropping out of a job, dropping out of relationships. You're going to prevent them from going into alcohol and drug addiction. So that there's a fiction out there that if you stimulate, if you give stimulant medications, for example, to patients with ADHD, you're going to get them addicted to stimulants. Not true. It turns out that if you know what you're doing, you know how to treat these patients, you decrease the odds of addiction. You decrease the odds of school dropout. You decrease the odds of alcoholism because you're decreasing the stress of this individual. You're improving their self-esteem. You're enabling them to live a normal life, obtain a decent job, and feel good about themselves. And if you can encourage that, there's no way in the world you're going to increase the risk of addiction. Plus, if you have an individual who is inherently an addict by predisposition, they can be addicted to glue, they can be addicted to food, they can be addicted to alcohol, they can be addicted to anything. But if I'm treating them with any medication and they need more and more of it, that's a side effect. We stop the treatment. We prevent the addiction that they may have to that particular treatment. We treat them another way. So that most people don't recognize that you have to treat. When you treat individuals, you have to evaluate what is the risk of non-treatment versus the risk of treatment. The risk of non-treatment for these disorders it's horrible. It's devastating for many. Now some got by, many famous people get by, but for every famous pe person that gets by on his own, there's a thousand or ten thousand individuals that don't get by, that flunk and fail. For every creative individual with this problem, there are thousands and thousands of uncreated, untalented individuals, just average people. Now, if you throw them so to speak, to the wolves, are on their own and are only worried about what the side effects of medication is. What are the risks of non-treatment? We know what the risks of non-treatment are. They drift into drugs, they drift into alcohol, they flunk out, they fail, they drift from one social situation to another, one marriage to another, one job to another. We know what those risks are. Depression and anxiety disorders, to name a few. However, the risks of treatment by comparison are none, especially if you know what you're doing. My analogy is you, if you drive a car and you know what you're doing, you're not going to get into an accident if you have a 1930s Ford. If you don't know how to drive a car, you're going to have a Ferrari and a million dollar car and you're going to get an accident every five minutes. So it's the driver that counts not the medication. Medications are inert substances. They're dumb things like a car. You need somebody who's mindful, who understands the problem, to be the driver. If you drive that car well, if you drive the medications well, the risk is almost zero. Versus the risk of non-treatment is terrible. And now research has shown that the incidence of addiction 
in stimulant-treated individuals and the risk of criminality in stimulant-treated individuals is less. But it makes perfect sense on the basis of what I've just said.